So Chesterton, uh, many of you know of the company. It's a 134-year-old family-owned company located north of Boston, Massachusetts, uh, home of the New England Patriots, if you're a football fan, or the Bruins, if you're a hockey fan. And uh, we are a, a, an ISO 9001, 14001 uh, company. Uh, but truly, our vision has always been to provide you, our valued customer, with innovative solutions uh, to go about achieving better plant performance. And we do that by not only providing products, but also knowledgeable service that helps you implement any solutions in your facility. So the goal today is where can we bring together the combination of product services and knowledge um, and increase your awareness and the importance of lubrication as it pertains to reliability. Where can we better utilize plant personnel with this education, how we might implement a lubrication survey and work with your team of reliability engineers to enhance uh, probably what you're doing already very well, but maybe a little bit extra coming from uh, a valued supplier. And then lastly, share some good success stories where we have actually uh, put these things in practice. Um, you know, uh, as we approach industry, we know uh, there are many driving forces in the power generation industry. Uh, you know, certainly over the last eight years, uh, through government legislation, uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, uh, the power generating uh, industry has been heavily legislated and impacted by um, certain uh, policies. Uh, but what drives all of us in, in, in helping you make power efficiently is how do we effectively implement things that help you uh, wrestle with rising costs? Can technical solutions be implemented to help drive costs down? Where can we save energy, reduce waste? How can we um, have more efficient use of maintenance costs, manpower, things of that nature to obviously help absorb operational costs. Uh, where can we minimize production costs within your facility? Um, and sometimes that might be just looking at how do we maximize performance and productivity of the existing equipment you have and refacilitating vital resources so equipment lasts longer. Um, certainly we're going to look at some of our activities might be in the direction of managing safety risks, uh, lost time, cost avoidance, manpower uh, impact when trying to lubricate things that are in hard to reach areas, confined space, limited, ac limited access. Um, looking for ways to enhance uh, our environmental exposure, um, you know, scrap pieces of equipment that fail, that are sent out to, into the boneyard, that's a huge scrap rate. And that's an environmental impact that we need to take a look at in some cases. And certainly, as we go about the business, do we have any eco-friendly uh, eco technologies and solutions? And believe it or not, equipment life extension, sustainability repairs is a environmental impact uh, methodology. Every time we extend the life of a piece of equipment uh, by whatever means, uh, there's an environmental credit or positive impact that we can think about. Um, it's not just financial, but certainly financial is a big one. And looking at total costs of failure, right? So anticipated savings and, you know, as we go about our business here, just be aware that we're trying to find those areas that impact profitability. What is the impact on our bottom line cost of operation and profitability of your facility? Now, there's, in industry, um, there is a factor that we can go by. In the refining industry, it's one to 20. Right? Every dollar of bottom line profit that's consumed in repair, maintenance, et cetera, it requires $20 in sales to recoup $1 in bottom, bottom line profit. Power is anywhere from seven to $10. So as we look at bottom line savings, 
think about the impact on saleability. Right? So there is a huge number uh, where we can look at gains by reducing bottom line costs. So where are the real costs when we talk about lubrication as a system? Uh, you know, so it's not just the cost of the lubricant, the lubricant price, cost per drum, cost of disposal, uh, maybe someone, you know, lubrication equipment, but the hidden costs are, are down below. And what is the cost of lost capacity, maintenance over time, uh, labor, uh, uh, lost opportunity. Um, if you're a peak load unit and you're designed to, to have a 24 hour startup and the equipment's not ready, how much money are you gonna spend buying additional power off the grid because some circulating water pumps could not operate because of bearing corrosion, for example, or soot blowers uh, did not actuate properly because they've been down for a period of time. If you're a base load unit, you wanna stay up and running continuously. Any unexpected outage because of equipment failure certainly uh, is a high cost uh, that has to be absorbed. Uh, and again, what is the impact on by lubrication on system reliability? Um, so we have to change sometimes our courses and and that is you know lithium number two grease or lumen complex number number one um, might not be the way we specify certain lubricants anymore but but take a look at what we can do to enhance lubrication now that we have an, in, an understanding of, of what might be some of the costs. And we, we sit here and we, we take a look at the cost of bearing or production losses, downtime costs, equipment costs, maintenance costs, uh, inventory and, and logistics costs. They all roll up and when a component breaks, what is the true cost of failure? And then there's the challenge. How can I make a sustainable repair to extend that piece of equipment the next time? Um, so we take a look at optimizing productivity. And, you know, we're sometimes it might be in that firefighting mode we might be into predictive maintenance mode and um, we're looking for ways to fix it fast, maintain it. But the challenge that we all have is what can we do to really optimize the performance of that piece of equipment? Go above and beyond what might have been status quo and strive for equipment sustained excellence. You know, if a piece of equipment has a, a theoretical design life of 10 years, and because of where we put it in our facility, we're only getting two years out of it. What do we need to do to optimize that delta of eight years? Right, so there's some room to look for opportunity to extend equipment life. We've done it in valves, for example. We used to replace packing in valves every year. Now with some sustainable improvements, repacks are now five years, six years, even 10 years. Think about bearing reliability. Bearings might be designed to have a theoretical life of 20 years, but in some parts of the plant, we're replacing them every six months. What is our opportunity here to look for different solutions or methodologies to extend that equipment life. And it can go on and on, whether it's pneumatic valves, chains on the soot blowers, gearboxes, et cetera. The strive for promoting, promoting excellence and looking for innovative solutions is that drive to world-class performance. So be inquisitive. Take that what if, look at calculated risks, try new solutions that might be a, a trial. Uh, 
you know, and, and dare to be great in terms of lubrication excellence. Because the goal here is to find a way to push out that bathtub of uh, bathtub curve of performance where we take what might be current status quo and we look for ways to pushing out the bottom of the curve to extend that equipment life cycle. Does that look familiar to you? And many of the plants it does. Go out and behind, behind many of the plants we see a, a boneyard of failed equipment. I look at that as lost opportunity, lost revenue, lost profit, lost manpower, and a challenge for lubrication experts and lubrication reliability people in your facility to say, what could we have done different to enhance that component and extend its service life in the conditions or the operating conditions in which that piece of equipment operated? Now, there's the critical thing, where it operates. Anything will last for its design life in ideal conditions. No, no water, no abrasives, no vibration, no load, you know, et cetera. But the challenge is put it in an FGD system, put it in the coal yard, put it down in a demineralizing area where there's real world, and now how do you get the theoretical life out of it? What would happen if we dared to be great and we reduced perishable costs of failure by 50%? What impact would that have on your facility? It's enormous if we look at a one to 10 ratio. You got a million dollar scrap yard there, multiply it by 10. So as we think about lubrication excellence, it just makes good sense. Good machine lubrication can lead to energy savings and an improved corporate profitability. So I'm just saying, talking about here, improved corporate profitability. That ought to be, or it should be, of interest to any plant manager who is looking for ways to reduce operational cost and is especially significant at a time when operating in a competitive global economy makes sense. We have to find ways to achieve more without spending a significant amount. Now, there's a word for that in the modern culture of, of reliability. And that word is called, or the, 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 the condition is called striving for the you know, optimum reference state of performance. And you know, optimum reference state of a performance. Set a goal on how you want it to perform above your status quo where it is now. Set your goal high, and then what do you need to do to achieve that reference state of performance? Um, we're not going to put a $500 seal on a $50 bearing, right? Think about it. Or maybe you would. What is the cost of failure versus your mechanical solution? But in terms of optimum reference state, it is that prescribed state of machine configuration, machine design, machine add-ons, if you will, filtration, uh, lip seal design, labyrinth seals, bearing isolators, breathers, what do, different greases, different lubricants. What do we need to do in this machine configuration to optimize its chance of success? In the operating conditions and with the maintenance activities that you are prepared to deliver. So. We're not gonna change operating conditions. It's a power plant, whatever it is, it is, right? Maybe you can improve it a little bit. Maintenance activities, people, procedures, product, training. That's a big one that we can tackle. So in this in terms of defining lubricating excellence, only after we establish 
the goal of optimum reference state, are we able to define the meaning of lubrication excellence as a process? Lubrication excellence is achieved when the current state of lubrication approaches that of the optimum reference state, right? The goal, right? How can we get that extra 50% life out of the gearbox? How, how can we reduce main pulley conveyor bearing failure? Or how do we reduce failure rates? How do we extend the life of motor operated valve gear drives? All of these go to that issue of optimum reference state of performance. And quite possibly, quite possibly, we have to change our current method of lubrication. It might not be a method, but certainly might be a procedure or a process, right? Do we have the right people doing the right tasks at the right time with the right type of training? Is the machine in a condition that would benefit from a heightened awareness by the people attending to it? Is it properly aligned? Are we trying to keep the water out? Are we doing things to help assure that the machine operates properly? Uh, foundations are good. It's not suffering from soft foot. Whatever we're doing, but we need to take a look at the surrounding and say, are we giving that piece of machinery the best chance of success mechanically? Third, precision lubricants. Ideal conditions versus adverse conditions. Believe it or not, there is a trend now, and I, I believe some 14 years ago, I started this concept of balanced lubrication theory, where performance-driven lubricants have to be balanced against the operating conditions, because when the film fails because of service condition, the equipment fails. So does it not make sense to design lubricants for the environmental condition where the equipment operates? Acid, water, shock load, vibration, heat. So the bearing is better protected. Then what type of procedures are we using to install the lubricant of choice? Methodology, quantity, frequency, and process. And then Last, but certainly not least, and it's very important, how do we analyze for success? You know, we analyze, we measure, we monitor, but if that's all we do, how do we interpret the analysis and the monitoring results to gain more? Right? Monitoring is one thing, but do we learn from it in this course of world-class excellence and sustainable improvement? Let's take a look at something. You know, there's a noted uh, industrial economist, an engineer, gifted engineer, Heinz Block, um, that worked quite a bit into the re in the refining industry, but also he's, he was uh, partnered with 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 Epri. Um, let's take a look at something that he did. Um, he took a plant and did an analysis on the total cost of operational and energy costs, which in this facility is $12 million. So it's 96% of the overall budget. The maintenance cost at this facility that he was doing a, an economic audit on was about 3.9, let's call it 4%, or just under a half a million dollars in maintenance budget. The total lubrication cost, right? The price of the oils and greases that were being used uh, was $12,500. Think about this. In this particular plant, which wasn't overly large, that the operating cost was $12 million, but the lubricant cost was only 12000 His whole job was to look for ways to improve sustainable repairs. And through efforts as a lubrication specialist, one thing that he did was let's target areas within the lubrication regime where we can make a significant impact. And that was in some cases on monitoring, measuring, 
contamination control, maybe different lubricants used in a, a different fashion or trying to find robustly en engineered lubricants. Certainly the cost went up and his study went to almost $40,000, you know, a 300% increase in his lubricant cost. But look at the return. He was able to document a $4 million savings in terms of overall plant operational and energy costs. Making something last longer using this one to 10 ratio is huge. So as an example, here's a, a simple, you know, fan, we'll call it a fin fan. Uh, but uh, as an example, right, there was a, a $1,648 attributed failure because of a, a, a fan bearing failed. Um, the total cost of the work involved was $140. That was uh, procedure and work and inspection. Um, certainly, there was a cost of the lubricant. Um, so there was a, a total cost per incident of $1,508. Uh, out of which there was a cost for the lubricant, $72.93. Um, what he was challenged with is, is this. If, if we increased the, it, with enhanced lubrication, in this case, um, uh, $72.93, uh, uh, and brought the lubrication, enhanced lubrication component up to $212, there was a three time life extension to the bearing, which just on episode translated into a $5,000 cost avoidance for that one incident. So things like this are achievable, right? For a small incremental change in the lubrication regime had a 300% impact on sustainable, long-term reliable service of that particular fan and necessarily a cost savings. That was just a cost saving just on the component, never mind all the ancillary costs for proper cooling tower function. So what are we talking about when we're looking at, at, at bearings, right? So we've all seen this chart before. Countless lubrication seminars have shown this, this chart saying, oh, the reason why bearings fail is because of bad lubrication, bad procedures, or improper handling or mounting. Well, let's let's take a look at really what that means. Um, you know, bearings are designed to have a theoretical life. It's called the 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 uh, L10 life is the theoretical life in run terms of running hours, assuming a 10% failure rate. And for spherical bearings, that's uh, just under six years. For ball bearings, it's approximately three years. You know, 25,000 hours. But in reality, bearings have a theoretical design life to failure at 90% failure rate, anywhere from 20 to 40 years of service in ideal conditions. Once we throw real world conditions, this all goes out the window because real world conditions challenge the lubricating film and directly impacts how that lubricant performs within the confines of the bearing housing. Uh, no wonder that as we look at some of these pie charts, we say, well, you know, bearings only achieve fatigue rate, you know, 9% of the times. Well, we have to look at the impact of environmental conditions on, on bearing life um, and how it impacts the life cycle of the lubricant is ultimately we're trying to avoid things that look like this. Um, you know, uh, I don't see any bearings in that bucket that indicate fatigue failure. I see rusting, I see uh, carbonized grease, I see excess heat. Um, and maybe there's a few in there that show fine grain spalling, but there's other conditions on bearings that when you inspect them that are not indicative of fine grain spalling, but more indicative of pitting corrosion, stray arc, galvanic corrosion, uh, unusual wear lines because of load or vibration, 
Brunelling. And we have to challenge that and say, these are environmentally induced. And they're certainly an area of improvement. So what is the impact of environmental conditions on bearing life? So uh, SKF and some other folks uh, certainly have produced this bit of information. And you know, on, on design life of a bearing, uh, speed is, is proportional right, in the life of the bearing. If you think about as a bearing rotates, you're always having a vibrational frequency that's flexing the inner and outer race. As speed doubles, you increase the frequency of this distortion, this creation of the hydrodynamic film that distorts the raceway with every revolution. As you double the speed, you double the frequency and you flex that bearing twice as fast. So fatigue failure is proportional. Load, since load is the CP ratio is to the cube, as you double the load, you reduce the life of, by the, of the bearing by a factor of eight. So load is a huge impact on bearing life. So think about belt-driven equipment, for example, or bearings that are supporting um, uh, shafts which are fairly long. Uh, I quite frankly think of mixers, agitators, uh, drive pulleys on conveyors, things of that nature where this comes into play and certainly belt-driven equipment. What about vibration? Now, vibration, you increase the inch per second vibration uh, by two, you reduce bearing life by 75%. So it's a one to four type ratio on vibration and bearing life. And in 1968, Exxon Mobil Company a uh, gentleman there by the name of Scott uh, produced this information, but it's been duplicated by SKF, and every bearing company uh, produces this information that was first done by Scott, that 200 parts per million of water contaminating bearing lubricant, whether it's a grease or oil, reduces the life of the bearing by 48%. Now, the interesting thing is you cannot see 200 ppm of water. Water is visible in your hydraulic oil or bearing oil at around a thousand parts per million. So you are you cannot see dissolved water unless you send it out for testing and get a Carl Fisher done on it. And even then, some of your go no go points are set at 700 ppm, but at 200 ppm, 50% reduction in theoretical bearing life. <clears throat> then of course you had hard you have hard contamination. So if we take and we take take a look at these variables of water load vibration speed and we assign a correction factor to it the impact on bearing life is the product of the variables right product of the variables so if you have water which is correction factor of 0.5 <coughs> And you have a theoretical life of 20 years and you have water exposure, you just whacked it down to 10. If you have that same bearing in a water application driving a mixer or agitator in your FGD system and it's belt driven, <coughs> you now take that 10 years and multiply it by 0.25 and now you're down to two and a half years. So you can see you have the multiple of the variables impacting the life of the bearing. And in the worst case scenario, a 20 year bearing <clears throat> has a two month life projected life cycle. So equipment reliability and bearing reliability go hands, hand in hand. Operating conditions have an impact on, on the lubricant and the performance of the lubricant within the confines of the bearing housing. That equipment sometimes is stored for a long period of time uh, as, as, as backup material. And we have to be mindful that even in a static condition, that components must be properly lubricated to withstand the long periods of 
I might want to say inventory confinement. You know, those electric motors that you take off the shelf and install, um, what grease is inside the bearing housing and that motor's been sitting around for a year, is it ready to run? Uh, likewise for gears and, and pneumatic cylinders and things of that nature, chains uh, or another one. And the good thing is that we do know that there's a, a standard out there called DIN 51825, which is primarily for bearings, greased bearings, which takes into consideration operational factors, real world conditions, and how we might want to lubricate those bearings in real world conditions. Uh, it also drives balanced lubrication theory in that when you have severe or non-ideal conditions, how might you select a lubricant that is better designed to survive in those conditions? Bearing survival is tied directly to lubricant survival. So we think of what's going on here. You know, we, we've, you know, the four C's of lubrication excellence, correct lubricant, right, the right technology, the right quantity at the right time, right frequency, and then the correct procedures, which includes not only how to install it correctly, but how to monitor, survey, and, and uh, observe successes. So let's take a brief pause and, and look at lubrication. I'm going to accelerate this a little bit because a lot of us has, have had some of the basics of lubrication training before. But a brief view, hey, what is the role of lubrication in the first place? Well, it's designed to separate the components, reduce wear and friction on this hydrodynamic film, it's there to reject contamination, uh, basically to exclude contaminants from the confines of the bearing race, whether that means forming that film behind the seal, the lip seal, whether as we re-lubricate it flushes the area. Uh, it's also there for heat dissipation, um, the volume of oil or grease absorbing any uh, rotational heat and dissipating it into the surrounding housing and also corrosion control right uh, whether we perceive it now or not um, a lubricant must have unparalleled resistance to corrosion and I don't mean copper strip corrosion or yellow metal corrosion in terms of protecting the brass or bronze components in the equipment I'm talking about corrosion to the bearing. Does the lubricant have sufficient corrosion inhibitors to keep that 200 part per million of water from corroding the carbon steel that the bearing's made of? If we look at the building blocks of lubrication, certainly one of the first things we always hear about is viscosity, temperature, and speed. And it goes to that issue of separation hydrodynamic separation on a film of oil or grease sufficient to keep the two parts from touching. Under the loaded condition, <clears throat> is there enough hydrodynamic forces to keep the parts separated at the speed and temperature that you're operating? Okay, that's the building block of lubricant design. <clears throat> Am I using the right thickness at the right temperature given the speed? ideal conditions. And what is typically mentioned in your OEM manual is exactly that. Use an ISO 150 oil or an NLGI number two grease. Very little is mentioned about operating conditions. As you can see here on this chart, what temperature does your equipment operate? The OEM manual is basically set up around 40 degrees Celsius. So in this case, it's recommended to use an ISO 46 viscosity base oil. But if I take that piece of equipment off the shelf in my warehouse, and I now put it in an application where I operate at, a, at 90 degrees Celsius, 
you have to make a viscosity adjustment to use an ISO 320 base soil to a temperature compensate to maintain the same thickness at a higher temperature. So as a building block, do we temperature compensate and choose a viscosity based upon our operating temperature? Or do we just use what's stated in the OEM manual for the piece of equipment? Because when that film breaks, either by shock load, heat, uh, displaced by water, whatever, the environmental condition challenging the film, we now have metal to metal contact this boundary and limited film lubrication. And this is where tribology comes into place. The science of additives that played out on the surface perform, uh, uh, perform the function of creating a chemical film that prevents or reduces component wear, wear by fretting, galling, corrosion, chemical attack, galvanic attack. And we do this by modifying the surface properties and re-engineering the surface. You know, this is not a new technology, right? But it's certainly not old either. Um, it was first published back in 1966 by a gentleman by the name of Peter Jost, um, who was doing a study on the impact of lubrication failure or the impact of wear and corrosion on, on components and the impact on, in this case, the, the European economy was 1 to 1.4% of GDP. In other words, if I properly lubricate, given this emerging science of additives and tribology, the impact was financially enormous. So what is tribology? Using certain type of synergistic additives to provide a wear shield on the components such that the piece of equipment functions more in line with theoretical ideal, even when we put the equipment in harsh environments. And the good thing about this whole lubrication performance aspect is that we can measure it. We can monitor it. As a matter of fact, if we carefully look at data sheets, we can actually select enhanced lubricants based upon a sequence of ASTM tests that allows you to choose one lubricant versus another. It's almost like we take a look at this balance and say there's design criteria of the lubricant on one hand, but it has to be balanced off by the operating conditions on the other. Of course, in the middle of the fulcrum is our viscosity, temperature, and speed. But how often do we look at water resistance, load resistance, wear resistance, oil separation in terms of heat? How about dropping point? And as we approach this methodology of selecting lubricants for environmental conditions, we might be able to achieve, achieve something like we have in front of us here, where we took some fan bearings in wet conditions, vertically aligned, and where they were using a typical lithium complex grease and they were having this service life as indicated on this scan, uh, relatively short, uh, the bearing was changed, a different lubricant was used with enhanced pro properties to handle water, corrosion, anti-slump for vertical, and we actually started to get 300 plus percent increase in bearing life simply by looking at what does the piece of equipment really need versus what was in the OEM book. And there's a series of tests, right? So there's uh, load and water resistance and oil separation. And we'll, we'll see that here as we look at a data sheet. Uh, you know, here's an optimized grease. Here's an optimized grease on the side. And we put these here as, as benchmarks, right? Uh, well, take a look at the A, B, C, D, where these are data sheets 
or information that from variety of commodity lubricants that we found in the power industries that we serve. Uh, how much oil separation is, 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 is tolerable? Well, as little as, as possible, right? Uh, you don't want oil running out of the bearing housing. Uh, what's corrosion resistance? Well, against water, uh, uh, we want to protect against rust. So there's a test for corrosion resistance on carbon steel. What about water washout? How much water is displaced or how much grease is displaced from behind the lip seal because of water ingestion? What's the ability of the grease or the lubricant to handle mechanical load, right? Four ball weld load, there's a test to measure that. So as we look at a data sheet and we balance against the, our operational conditions of heat, pH, water, shock load, vibration, and metalware, we have an opportunity to look at performance data and to see how it might help us in providing a lubricating film that is better suited to resist operational conditions and thereby extend service life. You know, there are some of these areas where uh, some of the older technology where they use solid additives, uh, uh, graphite, PTFE, molybdenum disulfide. Um, and as a solid additive, you know, think about, you know, back in 1966, 70s, early 80s, right? Solid additives were the thing, right? You could look at them, you could see them, you could measure them. Um, they didn't have a lot of the chemical intricacies, um, the capabilities that we do now. Uh, now we're more involved with chemical additives versus solid additives. And to be sure, molybdenum had its place uh, many years ago. Uh, it's certainly still there now as older technology. But in any type of, of, of grease that you look at, whether it has molybdenum or not, what are the performance criteria? Uh, you know, 350 kilograms, 400 kilograms, how much load will that lubricant take? We, even with the molybdenum or the solid additives. So there was a question uh, about that. Um, so the next phase is once we take a look at lubricants and might we might wanna optimize for our application condition, what's the quantity and frequency? How much, how often? And uh, most OEM guidelines are not operational focused they focus on ideal conditions. So when you open up the book for an electric motor, understand that it's with no water, no dirt and dust, no chemical exposure. It's based upon a 24 hour duty cycle. So there's no start and stop. It's aligned within one thousandth of an inch per inch shaft diameter. And now we take that motor and put it in real world. Do we follow the guidelines that are in the book? What about we take this pillow block bearing, whether it's an SKF Timken or, or, or somebody else, we open up that manual and we see that it's calling out, use a ISO 220 lithium number two grease and lubricate the bearing every four months. Well, is that reflective of where you're actually gonna put the bearing? I don't think so. From what we see, it's reflective of ideal conditions and focusing on the mechanical design of the bearing, the clearances, the size, and the speed of the bearing, and not focusing on some of the environmental conditions where we place it. So let's take a look at quantity very briefly. How much grease goes in a bearing is a mathematical calculation. Uh, based upon the bore diameter and width of the bearing times a, a factor, in this case for grams 0 0.005. So theoretical life, right, 0 0.005. If you make a monthly route, the correction factor is 0 0.003. If you make a weekly route that you want to 
give the bearing a kiss of grease on a weekly basis, you use 0 0.002. And in some cases I've seen where the operator is told to grease the piece of equipment daily before he starts his work, then the correction factor is 0 0.0003 grams of grease. So how does that really make sense, right? So here's a, um, an SKF uh, 22226 EK bearing. Here's the dimensions. <clears throat> so for theoretical design life, it takes 74 grams of grease. Um, <clears throat> and then we can look at our routes, if you will, uh, monthly, weekly, daily, and we can get our greasy uh, greasing amount based upon our routes that we wish to take. Um, however, that doesn't involve environmental impact. It's still one of these things where you have excess heat, excess dirt, excess water. We might have to use more grease more often. So that's where this comes in. Frequency. Uh, a more scientific way to calculate frequency is by DIN 51825, which takes into consideration six operational conditions. And there it is. You guys that have a, a calculator in front of you have at it. But in a nutshell, what it's taking is the theoretical design life. It's taking that quantity of grease that we've calculated, in this case, 74 grams. And in this case, let's take a look at, well, I, I it operates at between 150 and 175 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the correction factor is 0.5 for heat. What if I have heavy non-abrasive dust? Correction factor is 0.7, in this case, by virtue of this example. But there's a range depending upon how severe, severe the dust is. What about water, right? Water cascading down the housing as if it's on a filter press or it's just outside under high humidity conditions. There's a correction factor on frequency. What about vibration? 0.2 to 0.4 inch per second versus less than 0 0.2. And what if the, if the bearing is positioned horizontal, vertical, or at an angle? And then one on design. Is it a ball bearing, a cylindrical roller, or table, tapered spherical? So all these come into play they become the summation of the variables as K factor. And then instead of having my theoretical time, T, I calculate the corrected value for frequency. And now I have something that's reflective of real world conditions. Now, Let's go after this motor, for example. It was a motor or a pillow block bearing, a, a pulley on a conveyor. I'm just using this as an example. So in the OEM guide for this particular motor, let's say I have a, a 280 frame motor and ball bearings based upon the interval are somewhere between six months or so to 18 months for a ball bearing. For a roller bearing, it's somewhere around six months. Again, it's RPM based ideal condition. And in these cases, the lubricant is replenished on a six month interval. So here it is, how much in this particular case for this frame size motor, 10 grams of grease or eight pumps of a grease gun every six months. Now let's take a look at what happens if I use operational reference state, DIN 51825, and I now employ correction factors, the same ones that I used as the drop down. The OEM manual says lubricate every six months, but now calculated by virtue of us doing our survey and providing you real world correction factors, that motor actually requires to maximize bearing life Relubrication every two months in the conditions in, in which that motor is placed. So now I have quantity and frequency. So now let's address procedures. Uh, 
I think we're all somewhat aware of things, right? So always keep the equipment clean, equipment uh, fittings, work areas, etc. Shop rags are non-cotton. Uh, I personally like the, the, the microfiber uh, that doesn't shed lint, right? Trying to minimize third body wear in the bearing housing is critical. If it's a new bearing, we take it out of the package, check for rust, check for fingerprint corrosion. Was the bearing stored correctly for a period of time? Um, certainly we wanna pre-fill the bearing with the correct amount based upon calculations. And you wanna fill the housing to the correct level based upon service condition. Bearing housings are filled between 40 and 80% of the entire volume based upon service condition and where the, lurk, the Zerk fitting is on the housing. We always tell our guys, don't spin or shake or move the, uh, an unlubricated bearing. When you take a bearing from the package, it is not properly lubricated. Maybe a light film of storage oil, that's it. Personally for myself, any bearing that comes into your warehouse should be lubricated with a good grease and then stored to possibly allow for vibration of the shelves or things that are, are handled as the maintenance guys go to install them. Handle bearings with rubber gloves, not cotton uh, gloves. Make sure things are lint free. Um, double check to make sure that the grease of the grease or lube required. Don't mix lubricants and really assure that you're not using anything that is incompatible. Uh, before you lubricate, clean the fittings with a with a new clean lint-free cloth. Again, microfiber is preferred. <clears throat> Introduce the lubricant slowly. In terms of grease, one pump or one stroke of the grease gun every two to three seconds. The electric guns that put in up to six to seven times the amount of grease in, a, in, in seconds is prone to overpressurize the bearing, distort the bearing, and cause damage to the bearing. Uh, introduce the grease slowly. And typically, always while the bearing is turning, to redistribute that bearing around the entire circumference and not just trap it into the top of the housing. Always wipe off any excess grease from the fitting. Don't leave it as a mess to collect dust and dirt. And then of course, monitor after you have installed it, at least for the first 30 to 45 minutes for any uh, increase of operational temperature and then implement a long-term vibration analysis or ultrasonic analysis to measure the bearings health over your operational life. Um, here's a nice photo of uh, someone properly manually filling a bearing housing uh, and then using an ultrasonic attachment to monitor the, the noise from the bearing and to observe the change of uh, spectra as he introduces the grease. And as you can see here, the spectra indicates before lubrication, after lubrication as he's starting to put in the grease, and then you always have that condition where you start to introduce that last little quarter pump and you start seeing the onset of over lubrication, then you stop. If you continue to lubricate, you're gonna have excess heat and you're gonna have that, that spectra that you see there uh, further to the right where excess noise caused by over greasing. You know, in some cases, automatic lubrication might be necessary. Um, conditions that are particularly unsafe, right? Hard to reach, confined space, areas that might have uh, uh, issues where safety is preeminent. And I think most of that is where we're going after or where uh, it's just hard for your maintenance staff uh, to get to. Uh, coal conveyors are a great one. Uh, 
uh, for that cooling tower bearings and motors are another area that come to mind. Or if we look at this type of an arrangement, uh, multiple points uh, that have a tremendous amount of, of debris uh, associated with the area of use. Uh, FGD systems come to mind for that one. Uh, coal yard applications on conveyors are another one. Uh, so I might want to look at the implementation of a automatic dispenser, motor driven, either direct mount or through a divider block to multiple point lubricate. And uh, these things don't have to be overly expensive. Uh, not uh, You don't have to go the $25,000 route for 20 or 30 points, but certainly there's economical ones out there that can lubricate single point or multiple point up to eight points uh, through a progressive sequential divider block. And uh, we'll see a couple more pictures of those as we look at applications. Uh, so ideally with automatic lubrication, we're trying to take that calculated amount of grease and apply it over the frequency time in small doses. We are not applying a huge bolus of grease and are then allowing, hopefully allowing the grease to deplete itself over time. But we're more precisely delivering the grease on a daily basis. And that's world-class lubrication in uh, uh, our opinion. So areas of the power plant. Now we're getting into the, the crux of the matter, right? So areas of the power plant where we have seen this ORS, operational reference state, enhanced lubrication makes sense. And when you get your links, you'll have this entire presentation. Uh, and there'll be a link to applications within powerhouses. And I'll go through some of them uh, specifically. Um, conveyors, coal feeding areas, pulverizers, uh, boilers, for example, soot blowers and things of that nature. Uh, certainly fans. When you take a look at condensate systems, um, lubrication of condensate pumps and vacuum pumps. Certainly if you apply bolting lubrication, uh, bolts need to be lubricated. There's a whole different opportunity out there for proper lubrication of threaded fasteners. Uh, you want to, you know, an anti-seize is in fact a, an assembly lubricant. So you properly achieve clamping force of your gaskets. And uh, that's a whole nother webcast that we'll have. Uh, cooling water and service water conditions from, from screen wash pumps to traveling screens to, to cooling tower, fin fan uh, associated components. And certainly fly ash handling uh, from rotary airlock feed valves to slurry pumps, uh, outfall pumps to filter screws and presses. Uh, any of these components require lubrication and they're certainly not in ideal conditions. Uh, flue gas desulfurization, uh, anywhere from a pH of 12 to a pH of 1. It's an entire gambit of chemical attack and assault by abrasive slurry. So um, we, we absolutely want to take a look at where uh, ORS practices uh, can improve bearing life in these uh, uh, systems. So, um, so let's take a challenge. Um, let's take a challenge, dare to be great. Let's look at electric motors, um, particularly in electric motors that are operating in wet conditions within your power plant. Um, cooling tower applications, scrubber applications, lime slurry, uh, cooling water intake and outfall pumps. Um, these are areas where we have high humidity, in some cases abrasive attack, in some cases belt-driven equipment that would have shock load and abrasion. So when we take a look at some of these scenarios, here we have a, an array of vertical pumps. Uh, one thing that happens with vertical arrangement is the grease tends to slump in the bearing housing. And the grease slumps in the bearing housing, runs past the seal, and by the time you get around to regrease, you might be lubrication starved. Um, one thing that we've focused on is the ability to use these automatic dispensers 
to deliver a precise amount of grease on a daily basis to always keep those bearings properly lubricated with the correct film thickness 24 seven. Right, so this is one way that we optimize vertical, uh, vertical uh, pumps as well as vertically mounted motors uh, within your facility. So in this case, electric motors in wet corrosive conditions. You know, um, there was something done years ago by government accounting office that said that 75% of all the energy consumed by modern industry is consumed by electric motors. Right? That might seem a little high, but if you think about it, it's really not. Uh, there's a huge annual cost of energy, or you guys in power call it parasitic load, right? Uh, energy consumed by motors. Anything that we can do to lower frictional drag in the motor, proper lubrication, anything that we can do to enhance bearing uh, longevity is going in the right direction. Um, so this particular plant here improved motor bearing life and reduced failures by 80%. Now look at the condition. You got slurry dripping down, limestone, general corrosion. Think about what's going on to the bearings in that motor if all around that plant is corroding. Carbon steel bearings rust, just like the I-beams do. And if you put on automatic lubrication and an anti-corrosive grease that might not be polyurea, right? It will not be polyurea that we, you can achieve some longer bearing life. And in this case, a perfect example. So here we had a, a, a typical mill application where power plant, coal mill, the whole general area around there, where we were able to um, uh, reduce motor replacements by 90% and in fact return a total cost savings, right? Total cost, perishable cost, hidden cost, et cetera, so of over $400,000 returned back to the facility. Coal conveying, right? So think about how many circuits you have, coal conveyors. There is no redundancy. When a tail pulley, head pulley, snubber pulley, tension pulley fails, the conveyor comes down. So try to feed the silos. You're not gonna, it's not gonna happen. So think about coal unloading, whether it's a tipper or a continuous offloader. Um, the bearings associated with this rotating table have to be properly lubricated. Coal conveyings by either belt conveyor or screw conveyor, once again, those bearings are under a tremendous amount of shock load as well as corrosive uh, dust, and in some cases, the sulfur and salt that might be included in that coal is very corrosive. So we take a look at the pillow block bearings. Um, some of the bearings are fitted with a taconite seal outboard, which is which should be greased to help protect the bearing inside. But we can also do something very uh, imaginative, and that is there are two potential fitting areas just above the seal on the bearing housing. And we have been uh, not only greasing through the center zerk, but also drilling and tapping right above the seal and injecting grease into the seal, seal area of the bearing. We can also put on a, a automatic lubricator, in this case, the Chesterton Lubricup, to continuously supply a small amount of grease to that bearing on a daily basis, which helps exclude the abrasive um, contaminants from getting under the seal and into the bearing. So effectively, um, we've targeted you know, opportunities for where we can enhance um, the the lubrication of these components, in this case, tension pulleys, but it could be head pulleys and tail pulleys likewise. Um, 
estimated cost savings of this facility was over $100,000 in uh, perishable bearing costs as well as uh, 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 avoidance of downtime and things of that nature. Uh, soot blowers, now we're into the boiler end of things, right? So soot blowers, whether chain driven or gear drive driven, couple areas where we can consider things that require lubrication. As we look at something like this, chain lubrication, gearbox lubrication, and poppet valve lubrication. Um, we do have at our company a grease that is uniquely suited for gearbox lubrication versus oil. That's a very high pressure, thermally stable grease for uh, not only gear drives on these, but also on motor operated valves. Uh, high temperature lubricants for chains that do not attract dust and dirt and high pressure lubricants for the cam on poppet valves. So here's a, a case history on uh, these uh, Diamond G9 soot blowers where we're lubricating the uh, ring gear, crank and poppet valve with um, a product um, that we have. Um, we first cleaned the, the material with our 651 detergent lubricating oil to remove contaminants and then heavily lubricated with a graphite and molybdenum based grease, which is our 787 sliding paste. Um, and we can see here that as estimated increase in serviceable service life of these soot blowers was up to 12 times. There's the application of the 787 on the poppet valve, cam poppet valve mechanism. So likewise, again, reduced, increased the lubrication interval by four times and significantly reduced uh, component fatigue. We take a look at cooling towers. So what do we have there? S certainly significant amount of, of, of moisture, but also we have vertically oriented components and some components that are belt driven. Um, so we whether it's natural downdraft where we have uh, fans and uh, well not fans, but we have pumps and things associated with recirculating the water or fin fan coolers where we have a series of motors and fans to draw air through the fan uh, through the uh, heat exchanger mechanism. We're looking for areas to improve bearing life in wet conditions. And uh, this particular challenge here was on fin fan coolers and uh, here a enhanced lubricant or 615 grease was used to provide bearing lubrication through the use of automatic lubricators. And in this case, uh, on 12 fin fan assemblies, uh, this particular solution was able to save $225,000 uh, bearing costs, manpower costs, associated costs, um, because they were replacing the bearings on a six month basis. And we were able to push that out to a three year program. Um, so the total cost savings to the plan over, over annualized, uh, but projected three years was over three quarters of a million dollars. Uh, so again, things that we can look at to enhance components improve reliability, but also drive to the issue of saving substantial amount of money. Another application on fin fan coolers, slightly smaller, a small, a small facility. Again, uh, increased the bearing life six times, had a net savings to the plant just on bearing cost of $21,000. Whereas the solution was $1,000. So we have a one to 20 savings uh, in this case. Circulating water pumps, um, you know, the lifeblood of the plant is the turbine, but in order to keep, in order to make power, you gotta, you gotta circulate water. And uh, uh, these things have to be able to run uh, continuously and that standby pumps have to be able to start and run flawlessly. Um, some of the things that we do in these regards is to use, again, automatic lubricators to lubricate some of the critical bearings on, on, on vertical cooling water intake pumps. Um, 
we also use on horizontal pumps, similar mechanism, but in this case, um, we can direct mount them. So you can review the case history uh, on some of these as you get the links. But once again, uh, these things are in areas that might not be serviced that often. And one of the criteria here was how often can we go down there and lubricate a year round. And in some cases, the automatic lubricator is the best fit, along with looking at enhanced lubrication technology. Um, lime slurry, reagent pumps. Uh, if there's anything we can do here uh, to improve bearing life on some of these Krebs, Warman, other slurry pumps, it's, it's essentially money in the bank uh, in terms of uh, uh, payback on reliability. So we have things like this that take place on the left. On the right, we have enhanced lubrication with not only we're, we're, we're lubricating some bearings on the gearbox, we're lubricating the bearings on the pump barrel, uh, but we can also do something where if we're not going to put on a mechanical seal, we could high pressure inject grease into the stuffing box and grease lubricate the mechanical packing such that we can reduce water flush, if not eliminate water flush in some conditions. And there's some technologies for that with uh, very tight bushings, lantern rings, spiral tracks, et cetera, and then grease through those components of lantern ring and spiral track to grease the, the packing. Um, so here you see uh, uh, an array of uh, slurry pumps, not only uh, with the motors being lubricated, but the pump barrels being lubricated. And a, a small cost analysis for your consideration. So over greasing in terms of when a bearing starts to corrode, we start to hear noise. We can't stop the pump, so you begin to over grease to help the pump get along until we can repair it. And then we suffer from the, the excessive heat and eventually bearing failure. Um, so one thing that we can do to overcome corrosion uh, with all this water contact is to use an anti-corrosive grease. In this case, the Chesterton is 635 and automatically dispense the grease via the lubricups. cups. Um, uh, in this case, you know, after uh, uh, 36 months of flawless service, uh, no slurry pump bearings have failed. Vibration and trending indicate that the MTBR of these bearings will exceed the life of the casings. So we've now been able to have the rotary unit, the drive end, exceed the life of the, of the uh, fluid end uh, such that um, when the casings are replaced, uh, uh, the bearing and the rotary components are still in good condition. Uh, here we have a horizontal mill. Uh, you know, uh, some of the smaller plants have horizontal mills, so here we're lubricating some main drive shaft bearings. Um, some of these ball mills and sag mills are, are pretty expensive uh, in terms of the downtime cost and certainly ex extremely expensive in terms of the bearing cost. Um, so in this case, uh, this rotary, rotary mill that had been using a typical OEM lithium grease um, tended to melt out, but certainly you see all the, the dust and particulate contamination. Um, so it was decided to uh, upgrade the the condition with a thermal, more thermally stable grease in conjunction with putting on an automatic lubricator. Um, valving in your facility, whether air actuated bin gate valves or motor operated valves, there's an area where this component requires adequate lubrication. Many of these pneumatic valve systems are run dry uh, only because the pneumatic companies tend to suggest dry lubrication in wet conditions or in abrasive conditions. Well, it's not so much the fault of the abrasives, but more so the fault of just 
inherently inferior lubrication. Uh, isoparaffinic oils like turbine oil, hydraulic oil, are not designed to operate in pneumatic conditions. The moisture that is typically resident in pneumatic air supply uh, oxidizes the isoparaffinic oil and creates a condition where this isoparaffinic oil polymerizes to make uh, higher molecular waxes. And these waxes build up in the cylinder as well as the solenoids and actually causes more problems than they solve. Um, so we do make uh, a material called 652 pneumatic lubricant. It's a, a fully saturated naphthenic base stock fluid, ISO 22, base oil viscosity, and it's designed to clean and remove any residues, dust, dirt, particles, old varnish, wax, things of that nature to allow your pneumatic systems to function flawlessly. Uh, Hagen valves on air dampener control systems is another area where these things can be used, as well as uh, pneumatic vibrators on, uh, on cold bins. Um, we take a look at uh, the buildup on, on cylinders, for example, in the center picture on the case history. We can see what we're talking about is that uh, paraffinic waxy film and uh, properly lubricated. Um, we've seen conditions where we went from 200,000 cycles on, a, on the actuator to over 4 million cycles on an actuator simply by using some enhanced lubrication. We also have a situation on motor operated valves where the gear drive mechanism inside uh, needs to be properly lubricated. Uh, some of these things are lubricated by a standard bearing grease. As you can see, um, here we're chosen the our Chester in 615 grease because of the 620 to 800 kilogram weld load, uh, which is more suitable for gear mechanisms um, to protect the intricate gear drives that are on these. And the case history is also attached here for your consideration. Uh, you see some of these motor operated valves are in wet conditions, they're heavily corroded. And uh, not only is uh, the enhanced lubricant that we offer high load resistant, but it also is uh, immune to uh, corrosion in most of your wet conditions. And then also we have fans and blowers. And as we take a look at, at the uh, bearing housing on these things, um, uh, here we've used some of our other dispensers, but uh, certainly on these fans and blowers, you have dampener control systems that have, that require pneumatic actuators, which can be properly lubricated. Uh, but also the dampener control systems uh, where the, the dampeners are, are fixed on a long shaft with two bearings. Typically, uh, these things are running on the out, on the output, typically very hot and um, requires uh, a lot of greasing because of the heat, in some cases up to in excess of 300 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, uh, enhanced lubrication, looking at drop point, looking at oil separation, looking at thermal stability, and then allowing those three data points to help you choose a grease that is more able to handle the conditions. In this case, we were able to reduce grease consumption by 50%. Uh, we were able to extend the lube interval by 50%, and therefore we reduced grease, but also had a reduction of, of uh, labor uh, that was required to lubricate these things. So what's a successful plan, right? So successful plan, tailor the lubricant for the application condition. Look for the quantity that's appropriate for that particular bearing not only the quantity that goes in the bearing itself, but to what level do we fill the bearing housing? At what frequency do we replace the grease? And that frequency is driven by operational conditions. DIN 51825, or ask Chesterton or field reps to do our survey and we can do those calculations for you as part of our service. And then correct procedures. 
a review of the procedures to make sure we're doing best practices. You know, as we approach this, we want to find the ways to evaluate current practices, look for areas where we can have sustainable improvements, not only with, with equipment that's in the field, but also look at things that are stored in inventory, et cetera. But throughout the plant, where can we achieve more with less? Establish a good common procedure, best practices approach for that particular piece of equipment. Target OEM guidelines because they are designed for ideal conditions, not for real world. Take a look at greasing frequencies and amounts as well as technology. And then look for enhanced training, the how to of lubrication. So it starts with a survey and survey planning, assessment, information gathering, evaluation of what's being done, reporting, trying to generate as much information as possible on your current status, your current stasis of what you're doing. So then we can look for ways to dare to be great and improve. Look for a procedure that might enhance operational vitality. How much grease, what type of grease, how often, what type of monitoring, do I need automatic lubricators or not? What type of routings, what type of inspection plans might we do? Provide the training to the people, particularly when you introduce anything new, new concept, new grease, new delivery method, or just an awareness of, of doing things that are regard to best practices. Um, implant videos, implant training, um, industrial references, for example. Uh, I like to use, in my own training at facilities, I use a lot of materials that are provided by Noria. As a trainer, I bring some of those items in, uh, but certainly STLE and a variety of other uh, uh, providers of information their information can be can be utilized for that. And what Chesterton has done is we provided, eh, you know, pocket guide or a guide to proper bearing reliability, and we call this our pocket guide, pocket reference guide. And in that we we talk about viscosity and how to select the right lubricant based upon speed and size of the bearing and NLGI rating and what grease to use with operational conditions. Um, how much to fill the bearing in terms of free space of the bearing based upon the speed of the bearing and size of the bearing, how much to put in the bearing housing based upon where the zerk fitting is positioned and whether the bearing is in wet conditions or not. The quantity of grease, there's a diagram there on, on uh, how, how to calculate quantity. And then frequency, you know, there's the DIN 80, uh, 51825 but we've put together a chart that as a pocket guide where you simply take the RPM of the bearing, the diameter, and the type of bearing on the C, B, or A line, and it gives you the frequency based upon the mechanics of the bearing and type of the bearing. And then over on the next chart, there is the adjustment factors simplified, right? So ideal condition point, uh, uh, 1.0 to the worst condition possible adjustment factor 0 0.1. So in the case of the chart, if the, if the chart said lubricate the bearing every 9,000 hours, but if the correction factor was 0 0.1, we re-lubricate every 900 hours. And that's how we use this pocket guide very effectively. And then lastly, compatibility chart. So this is something you guys can get from Chesterton. You can download it. It's also available from our, our distributors and service partners, um, and they can order these and, and have these available to you. So as we conclude, I want to thank you all for attending the webcast. And, um, you know, this, this final slide might thing a might seem a little cheeky, but it certainly makes some sense if we think about it. 
you know, don't let lubrication be your weak link to performance. There's a lot of money spent on mechanical equipment enhancements, um, putting on a variety of other synchronized belts versus V belts, uh, labyrinth seals versus rubber seals, and, and you know, a whole array of things that we try to do. But as Heinz Block showed us, some of the smallest changes we need to make financially might be just looking at the lubricant that's performing that critical role of separation and how do we fine tune that fluid film to be better resistant to the service conditions where we're putting the equipment. Operational reference state is something that we want to set as a standard. We want to go after it. We want to set our standards high and look for enhanced lubricant design, frequency, quantity, et cetera, to try to achieve that goal. So on behalf of Chesterton, I want to thank you very much. Uh, again, the information will all be sent to you by a link, and you can download this presentation as well as other reference materials.